achievement in which we can describe everything that we know of particles, you know, in terms of 12 particles. You know, and that's just beautiful. However, it's not a pure unification in the spirit that, say, superstring theory would like it to be, because each one of the forces, electromagnetism, strong and the weak interactions, keep their imprint in the theory. And what we really want in the so-called grand unified theory or gut theory is that these three things become one. And the standard model certainly does not, does, does not do that. It's really bringing them together in a sort of a patchwork way. And that is, in fact, one of the reasons why we want to go beyond that. That's one of the motivations for string theory. Jim, have you gone beyond that? Where, where Brian is... is... Well, you know, it's, Jim. Been, it's been very interesting sitting on the stage and listening to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... You know, and I, you know, I am far from, from experimental physicists, as you can imagine. But this is why experimental... Which means you're a theorist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's code for I'm a theorist. I'm a theorist. theorist. Go on. Exactly. <laughs> but my point is that it is always the case that it is our experimental colleagues that prevent us from forming a religion. Because it is always grounded in what they can measure, as Martello keeps coming back to. And so, although people can express uh, either enthusiasm or dismay about where we are at a given point in time, I think that we need to be a little bit more humble and to understand that the process that we engage in is a constant flight from fantasy about what we would want to happen. And we query nature for that, and that query goes through experiment. So although this has probably been very entertaining for my audience here, I think that at the end of the day, we have to keep grounded in it's got to be about things that affect your lives, and those things are measurable things. So, so where, where, where has this pursuit taken you? Oh, my God. Where have you landed? Why would you ask that? I'm asking you that here and now. It's New York City. It's okay. March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. These are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers? That is correct. So the wait, wait, I'm still, wait. I have to just be silent for a minute here. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos? Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code? Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code, it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. That's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we say are supersymmetric. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Time to go home, I think. I mean, I, where are we going to go? Ahead? So, so uh, are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? Well, I didn't say that. I mean, some of those like the matrix? You, that's what the, you said. Some of those codes are, are showing on the screen behind you right now. They don't look like codes, but these pictures, which we call adinkras, are graphical representations of sets of equations that are based on codes. So this is, in fact, to answer your question more directly, I have, in my life, come to a very strange place because I never expected that the movie The Matrix might be an accurate representation of the place in which I live. Jim, may, 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 well, well, may Jim, I give you an argument that we don't live in The Matrix? A very, yeah, a very, please! Yeah. A very simple argument. Give me one argument. now, quick. 
very simple <laughs> argument. There's a, there's a property that the real world right down here has that no mathematical equation has, that no solution of an equation has, that no, okay, that no abstract object has. Here in the real world, it is always some moment, which is one of a series of passing moments. And a mathematical equation doesn't have a flow of time in it. It just is. No, and this but, means... But Lee... Wait, wait, Lee, let him finish. Wait, 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 I need him <laughs> here and now. <laughs> this means, that, to me, that the, 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 the ancient metaphysical fantasy that we quote are just mathematics cannot be true, because in a world that was just mathematics, there would be no moment of time. Why isn't Which there is this, math Lee, as a function Lee, of time? I'm sorry. We solve those, just, these are differential equations. But, no, but Lee, then you lay the solution Lee, out. Lee, X is a, yeah. you're mistaking. You keep using the word is, and I'm talking about the word describe. You see, but the describe whole, is fine. But no, no, then, no, no, but then but let, me, let me finish, please, since yeah. we started with my discussion. The point <laughs> is that I, I, you know, it's fun to talk about some deep metaphysical essence that sits behind physics. But for some of us, it's about trying to find the most accurate way to describe where we live. And so my statement is that in the description of our universe, that is a supersymmetrical universe, which we were going to test in the LHC. If you believe that description, I can show you the presence of these codes. That's my statement. That's beautiful, and that's fine. And I, I, I admire that. that. Seriously, that's fine. That's another beautiful piece of mathematics that may be explanatory or descriptive of physics, but that all I'm objecting to is that doesn't mean that we live in the mathematics. That means the mathematics is just descriptive of an aspect of the universe. I, and well, that's a good point. Let me matrix. follow that one up. Jim, yeah. Jim, just because, uh, who was it? Eugene Brigner, who's, who commented on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics that we just invent in our head, yet the universe follows, can be described mathematically. Mathematics is the language of the universe. Brian, math, gets, it, it, math is your tool. So why, should we be amazed or depressed by what Jim tells us here? Um, I, I can't really comment on what Jim says. I found myself in the unusual position of feeling rather conservative on a panel when usually I'm sort of at the outside. <laughs> and by the way, the pictures Jim showed all look like spirograph images yeah, I saw them. I from saw your them kids' and I, I thing. I don't know enough about them to comment, but there is an interesting question, the one that you raise, uh, about whether math is a descriptive of the universe, or we are the math, or what's the role of math you discover it is invented. I mean, I, I had a conversation, and I think you may have been involved in it, if not mistaken. The question was, you know, um, is, is math the right way of going about trying to find deep physical law? And I said, look, I can imagine one day we'll encounter aliens and they'll say to us, okay, show us what you've got to describe the universe. And we break out our mathematics and they look at it and they say, oh, math, we used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, a dead end, you know, and then they show us what they have found. Now, the problem with that is I don't actually even know what I would fill in regarding what they would show us because to me, mathematics is really the language of pattern. It's self-consistent ways of embodying pattern, and that's ultimately what we do. We're pattern recognition machines. We try to codify the patterns we see in the world around us in math, and in that way, we try to describe the universe around us. Does that mean we are the mathematics? I don't know. It becomes really hard to really know exactly what that means, but we have found that math so far is a potent tool for making predictions that we can test and confirm. And that's why I follow this particular trajectory. Uh, Brian, we're going to have to uh, very shortly go to questions from the audience. But I want to I come back at you with a couple of questions that are sort of uh, purposefully blunt. OK? Uh, yeah. So uh, you guys have been at this string theory for running on two decades now. And Einstein, working alone, went from special relativity to general relativity in 10 years working alone, <laughs> and, that, and it was a brilliant piece of work, and there was an experimental verification four years after he came up with the idea. Here you have legions of string theorists working two decades, and you're sort of not there yet. Is there just not enough of you? Is there re are you chasing a, a ghost? Or are the collection of you just too stupid to figure this out? <laughs> 
Um, I mean, I think it's pretty clear it's, it's, it's the latter. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, look, you know, Einstein was a singular genius, and making comparisons with him, I think, is perhaps not that representative. But putting that to the side, look, the questions that Einstein was trying to resolve, however deep they were, were still within a realm that was experimentally accessible within a couple of years, a couple of decades at most. We are ambitious, and we are trying to make a big leap to try to understand the universe on fantastically small scales and fantastically high energies. Why are we so ambitious? Because we have been so successful theoretically to date that the open questions in this line of research are the ones that we're now focused upon. They're much harder to test, and therefore we don't have the guidance of experiment to nudge us this way or that as much as in the past. Now, if we could solve these questions, I think we'd be answering some of the deep mysteries of the ages. Do you say, well, you haven't cracked it in 20 years, so it's time to give up? No, I think you say, if progress stalls, then you go and look at other directions. But as long as progress is carrying forward, and it is, you keep going and try to figure things out. You I can't think, place a time I, limit on it. I think your pace of progress is sufficiently slow that it has led to these other ideas exhibited on this panel. Because well, I don't you're know slow you, that you Jim know, is finding you know, I, that we live in a matrix. <laughs> and that, and that know, Marcello I, is questioning the whole idea of a, of, a, of, a, of, of, a, of a unified theory. Yeah, so I do worry about some of the things said on the stage maybe giving the wrong impression. But the bottom line is this. You have no capacity, as far as I know, to judge progress in the field unless you're actually deeply reading the theoretical papers in the journals. Are you doing that? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I presume I members of I, I presume that we got people here who <laughs> I, <laughs> That's why I brought the panel here. <laughs> that's why I brought this panel here.